and there are corollaries to those A, B, C, and D in Asia. So though, you know, that connection was made very early. Then we find, well, there's a couple of different types of A's, there's a couple of different types of B's, uh, C's. There's so it just gets more complex. It, it, gets, it resolves uh, tighter and tighter. We find an X that's thrown in there. Uh -huh. And if you go and look at Native Americans today, and you just went and sampled anybody who, well, and this is a problem. Sampling is a problem. When you ask, who is a Native American today, and how much <laughs> admixture, question. how much admixture from other known historical events have happened in Native American populations? So where do you go today, even to identify cleanly defined Native American? I think that it can be done. So I think there are pockets of those out there. I think we actually have evidence that that maybe that 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 has happened. But there also is a, a fair amount of European and other DNA admixture into Native Americans. And so you have to be able to identify that. And, would it be proper to say, would it be proper to, to understand that as a, uh, a diluting of the Native American DNA, or is that the wrong approach? Yeah, I, diluting, I think, gives the wrong idea. Okay. Um, uh, because Especially w with mitochondrial DNA, in that it is transmitted down from mother to child the grandchild on the female line, and it doesn't really get quote, diluted. I mean, it's okay. still there. It's still there. Uh, okay. Likewise, there's a piece of DNA that comes down on the male line, that uh, comes down Y chromosome DNA, that also uh, follows that uniparental inheritance. So we see from father to son to son to son to son. And so we okay. can do some of the same types of things that we've done with mitochondrial DNA with Y chromosome DNA, and that's just beginning. We know of um, less than a half a dozen uh, different Y chromosome types that we believe are native to the Americas. But then what we see are literally dozens of other DNA types that have entered into the population. The real question is, when did they enter into the population and from where did they come? And those are some okay. real because we know that there have been multiple migrations into the Americas. There was probably a very large early found, well, there was, there was an early founding event. How large that was, I'm not exactly sure. Right. And there, have been multi, there may have been multiple founding events. We're talking about 10, 15, and 20,000 years ago. Okay. People coming uh -huh. into the Americas and then filling up the Americas, essentially, or you know, yeah. spreading throughout yeah, the spreading Americas, around. spreading out around yeah. throughout the Americas. And then there have been multiple other migrations that have come into the Americas at different times. Probably the latest and, and most documented one is the European migration into the Americas after 1492. Yeah. And so, uh, but we know there have been other substantial migrations. We know that there have been other that. migrations, and okay. and so and, would and we even, be able to count the migrations? Even the migrations, even the migrations since 1492. I mean, you've got Europeans that came very early. You had uh, Asians that came in to help uh, build the railroads in the west of the United oh, States. Oh, that's true. And they that's ended a good point. up, and also in Mexico and other places in South America. We have Africans that came in. Uh, originally as slaves into the United States, into Mexico, into Central and, and South America. We have Germans that came into Brazil, uh, uh, World, World War II, Argentina, and Chile. Okay. We have yeah. Japanese. We had, a, we had a Japanese president of Peru. <laughs> okay. yeah. And so we have multiple migrations that have come into the Americas and have brought their DNA. And so sorting out all of these migrations and trying to understand when they came, how many came? Where did they come from? It is is a big is a trick. big question. Yeah. And so, trying to find then the echo of a very very small population that came into the Americas, uh, you know, 2,600 years ago, it is really a pretty big challenge. Yeah. And so, and, and you have to be very careful about how you design the experiments to go looking for that echo. So, so, is it even realistic when we're asked, well, why can't, why don't you LDS scientists like yourself, mm -hmm. you're, can't you LDS get your geneticists and DNA people together with the world's other DNA experts? Why can't you find Jewish DNA in the Americas if you claim well, I, it? You know, I can answer that really, really easily, and we do find Jewish DNA in the Americas. 
the question Jewish is DNA compliant. is here. But the question is, when did it come and who brought it? Oh, that's okay. okay. I'm with and you. And so we also see Japanese DNA in the Americas. We see Mongolian DNA in the Americas. We see Scandinavian DNA in the Americas. Well, this is the land of opportunity. Uh, Everyone's coming Exactly. Over. And so the, the question comes down is to when did it Are come? Are there ways to test the when of when DNA got here? If it doesn't, if it doesn't I can answer that uh, fade out. I can or answer or that a qualified yes. Qualified, okay. Um, uh -huh. And you have to be able to, there are a number of parts that have to come together to be able to get a good estimate of how long DNA has been in a particular place in the world. Okay. Uh, we have been able to reconstruct that in a lot of places, and we've been able to look to see <clears throat> uh, how that DNA behaved once it moved from one place to another. And, and sometimes sure. you'll see changes that are unique to one part right. of the world that aren't found in other parts of the world, which signals, well, there was, a, there was a common ancestor, one broke off, went to this place, and then differentiated in place uh -huh. and didn't migrate back to the other places. And so we have its own population over here. Okay. When you find those, then you, can, then you can sort of put a date on when did that event happen. Okay. So those are the types of echoes that we, we would be looking for. So it's, it's actually a very complicated question. The answers are not yet finished. We've got a whole lot of very interesting beginning I, data. I, I was going to ask and, you, one of my, one of my responses uh, has been when, when folks bring up this DNA issue, because I've done some videos on YouTube on DNA. Mm -hmm. I used uh, Meldrum and Stephen's book, mm -hmm. Who Are the Children of Lehi? Right. And I thought that had some really good <coughs> information it does. in it. Um, but I have approached it with the, the idea that we simply, at this point, we have to be tentative because we haven't tested everyone yet. What percentage of the yeah. American population, honestly, it's, it's Native un Americans, has been, even been tested to think, know? At, at this point in I time, know. it's unrealistic to think that we would be able to go out and test everybody who's That's Native kind of American today and do that. I mean, but I'm not convinced that we have to test everybody to answer the questions. Okay. Oh really? Oh, and interesting. So I, I uh -huh. think there are ways that we can we can go after and get some pretty good answers. So we're looking for more or less bigger patterns than crunching individual numbers, so to speak. Big patterns is the first start. Yeah. Yeah, and look okay. at populations and see what we see within populations and then between populations, and and how that all sorts out. And then then we can look at individuals and see some of the and see how they fit into all of these other parts of the. Tree. So is it realistic to say <coughs> the Book of Mormon is still plausible even based on the DNA studies that DNA have been done has so absolutely far? nothing to do with the Book of Mormon. Pardon? <laughs> DNA has nothing to do with the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon stands by itself, whether it's correct or not. It's not dependent on whether or not there's any DNA evidence to support it, okay, or to refute it. And I, I don't see, I don't see the evidence to refute at all. Interesting, interesting. All right, all right. Well, that's Dr. Scott Woodward. He's uh, now. Where do you? I'm actually the director of the Sorensen Molecular Genealogy Foundation. Which is a which is a, a private foundation that is building the world's most comprehensive DNA and genealogical database. Oh, how exciting! All over the world. All we're, over the world. We have DNA. We have about 110,000 DNAs that we've collected from more than 170 countries in the world. The DNA has been collected with uh, accompanying genealogical information with these people, so that we can use the DNA that's li that is present in people living today, and attach it to people who are parts of their genealogy. So we can go back two and three and four and ten generations in the past and place this DNA back into the past and help us move those few steps back in, oh, that's in, be building, exciting work, in huh? building the world family tree, essentially, based on DNA. Spectacular. Thank, Thank you very much. Appreciate it. This is the crowd here at the fair conference. We're just taking a break from the conference. A strongly attended conference this year. There's about 200 people. The bookstore is really good. Pretty good crowd. There's good old Kevin Barney. He's a good Hebrew scholar. You hey, can. Uh, there's our good friend Mike Ash. He's the executive, or uh, Mike Parker. He's the executive secretary of Fair. He's a good man.
There's the bookstore. I'm going to go in and show you some of the books in the bookstore.